Recently, we looked at the Curtis SOC Seagull, and today we're taking a look at the plane that was designed to replace it, but ultimately failed to do so, the SO3C Seamew. Development work on the Seamew began in 1937. At the start of the year, Curtis and Vought, the US Navy's main supplier of catapult scout planes, were approached to submit designs for a high-speed replacement of the SOC Seagull. The naval specification called for a mid-wing monoplane with a crew of two, a pilot and an observer. It required the design to feature a removable centerline float, one that could easily be replaced with a fuselage-mounted landing gear for land-based operations, and it also required that the wings had to be able to be folded back due to the deck and hangar space limitations aboard battleships and cruisers. All of this had to be built within a weight limitation of 6,350 pounds, however the most stringent and critical part of the design specification was the engine. The Navy wanted to use a new, experimental, and mostly unproven engine for this new Scout. This was an air-cooled 12.7 liter inverted V12 being developed by Ranger. It boasted a very low fuel consumption, and this greatly interested the Navy, as it meant they could increase the range of their scout planes without hampering their performance by adding additional fuel tanks. Unfortunately, this engine would prove to be the equivalent of an Achilles heel for the Curtis Seamew, though of course they didn't know it at the time. Curtis submitted their design to the US Navy in August of 1937, and in May of 1938 they were awarded a contract to produce a prototype that would be designated as the XSO3C1. At the same time, Vought also received a contract to produce a prototype, the XSO2U1, and the two planes would be evaluated against each other. In its original form, the Curtis prototype could be considered fairly good looking, Unlike its predecessor, the SOC Seagull, it was an all-metal design, ditching the fabric-covered fuselage and wings for stressed aluminium panelling. Similar to other Curtis monoplanes, the wing leading edge was straight, whereas the trailing edge tapered towards the wingtips. The two most recognisable features were the engine's exhaust stacks, which protruded out from the bottom of the nose, and the flush line of the upper fuselage that ran from the pilot's cockpit all the way back to the tail. The prototype aircraft was complete by the autumn of 1939, being initially fitted with a fixed landing gear, and it flew for the first time on the 6th of October. After this, it went on to compete in a series of competitive trials against the prototype submitted by Vought. Due to the strict requirement of the naval specification, both planes looked remarkably similar, and as such, their performance figures were also very close. Though the Vought design was 3 miles an hour faster, it was also over 300 pounds heavier than the Curtis, and after due consideration after the trials, the decision was made to go with the Curtis design. An initial production order of 300 units was placed, but before the first aircraft even left the factory, there were some worrying signs that not all would be well. In March 1940, Curtis gave the original prototype to the Navy for its final trials. Cooling and stability problems plagued these trials from the outset, and indeed there had been a few worrying signs in the earlier trials with both the Curtis and the Vought prototypes. Early on in these final tests, the engine overheated so badly that it completely failed, causing the prototype to sink in shallow water on the 21st of July 1941. Curtis took it back to their production facility at Buffalo for a rebuild, but the engine failed again later on in November. Unwilling to produce 300 versions of an aircraft that A. suffered in lateral stability, and B. had an engine that was so fragile it might as well have been a glider, Curtis sent the prototype to Langley Field to undergo a series of wind tunnel experiments to sort out the problems. Based on their findings, Curtis enlarged the air intake and added extra cow flaps, and while this didn't completely solve the heating issue, it did reduce it to the point that the engine wouldn't try to explode if the pilots looked at the throttle. The issue of stability was solved by a series of iterative changes that didn't happen all at once, but they ultimately resulted in the enlargement of the tail surfaces and rudder, the addition of a dorsal fin section that ran aft of the cockpit, and the addition of upswept wingtips. When the SO3C finally entered production, it was given the name Seamew by Curtis, 
but the US Navy named it the Seagull in 1941, which was the same name as its predecessor. However, despite being built later, it was in fact the first to be given this name, as the US Navy retroactively named the SOC as the Seagull when they were brought back into frontline service, an embarrassing topic that we will cover shortly. As a result of this, the SO3C is both known as the Seagull and the Seamew, but I always refer to it as the Seamew to prevent unnecessary confusion. It was built in three main variants, with a few single outliers. Of the initial production order for over 300 units, 141 would be completed as the SO3C-1, with the first of these aircraft being delivered in July of 1942. As a scout plane, its armament was light, a single forward-firing 30 caliber machine gun in the nose, and a rear-mounted 50 caliber machine gun for defense. It also had a set of wing racks that allowed it to carry a pair of 100-pound bombs. Potentially, it could also have carried a pair of depth charges as well, but I couldn't find exact numbers on this for the first production model. The second production model, the SO3C2, definitely could carry depth charges though, and they also came with a ventral bomb rack. The other main differences included the fitting of an arrestor gear for carrier use, and the fitting of an uprated version of the Ranger engine that now put out 520 horsepower. Approximately 200 of these second versions were built, making them the most numerous of the US models. After this, there were plans to build almost 700 of the SO3C3, but very few of these last models were actually built as the aircraft was being hastily withdrawn from service due to it being somewhat of a colossal failure. Though the heating and stability issues on the prototype had been fixed, once the production CMUs entered service with US fleets, a myriad of other problems quickly became apparent. The largest and most embarrassing of these was the inability of the CMU to make a water takeoff with a full fuel load. Now, admittedly, this was only partly the fault of the aircraft, as the Navy had also stipulated increased fuel load requirements. But regardless of this, it meant that the CMU could only take off from the water with less than half of its maximum fuel load aboard, which for a scout plane that needed long range was hardly ideal. Along with that particular issue, two other problems arose that made it vastly unpopular with the officers who had to fly it. Firstly, it was discovered that in rough water, the central float flexed so much that the propeller could actually strike it. This was unfortunate for several reasons. It damaged the propeller, it damaged the float, and it terrified the pilot. Secondly, the takeoff attitude from the water was alarmingly steep, to the point where there was a brief moment of time where the CMU would have no aileron control, and the pilot had to bring the tail up as fast as possible to maintain any control at all. This also meant that if a problem occurred, or if a strong wind gust forced a stall, there was zero hope of recovery. These problems, and a series of excessive operational accidents, quickly resulted in the early withdrawal of the CMU from service. It was then supplemented by the very plane it had been built to replace, the SOC, which quickly took on the CMU's naval designation of Seagull for itself. In the end, the CMU was such a failure that the average length of time that it was used on each of its assigned ships was just about two months. Following this, the Navy tried to find use for the CMU as a radio-controlled target tug, and these were redesignated as the SO3CK. This didn't last long, as they lacked the engine power for this sort of role, and they were rarely used. A number of the SO3Cs were ordered by the British Royal Navy under the terms of the Lend-Lease, and these would officially be known as the Seamew, rather than the Seagull, when in service with the fleet's air arm. These units were delivered with a fixed landing gear, an arrestor hook, and a central bomb rack. However, like their American counterparts, these planes were quickly disliked and discarded by British pilots, who referred to them as the Sea Cow, and most of the 250 aircraft delivered to the British ended up in Canada as target tugs. There is a famous quote about the Seamew that came from a British pilot by the name of Eleanor Lettuce Curtis, and her words sum it up best. It is hard to imagine how, even in wartime, such an aircraft could have been accepted from the factory 
let alone given valuable cargo space across the Atlantic. Harsh words indeed. But although it was a failure, the Seamew shouldn't be considered a failure of Curtis itself. Rather, it was the failure of an experimental engine, the failure of overly strict naval specifications, and then the failure of said navy to comprehend the consequences of changing the specifications after the aircraft had entered production. All of this would be proven by the Seamew's replacement, the Curtis SC Seahawk, a plane that wasn't hampered by design restrictions or an untested experimental engine. But that's a story for another day. As always, thank you all very much for watching, and a big thank you of course goes out to the patrons. I will get this list updated and the shoutouts for the Wing Commander tier patrons sorted as soon as I get back from my holiday, but thank you all so much, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.